Freedom Fighters Code Grey. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's happening across Canada, but also that's happening in our own backyard. What does human trafficking look like in Ontario? How prevalent is it? And what can we do to prevent exploitation in our communities? Well, today we'll be addressing those questions in this episode with Carly Church, who is a human trafficking crisis intervention counselor at Victim Services. I'm so grateful, Carly, that you're taking the time to join us today. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, Carly, just to begin with, can you share a bit about yourself and maybe your journey to getting involved in anti-trafficking work? Sure. So um, my name's Carly. I uh, work currently at uh, Victim Services of Durham Region as a human trafficking crisis intervention counselor. Um, And really previous to that, um, just to go back, I actually um, have my own lived experience as somebody who was trafficked. So I identify as a survivor of domestic sex trafficking. And now I really utilize my um, lived experience to engage and support with individuals in a way that's quite unique. Um, so when I got out, um, I actually got an, out um, in a way that was really helpful. Um, and I was able to have my needs met and connect with some really amazing people. Um, and when I exited, I really started to have this passion around like, how can I help other people? Um, my experience was uh, was exceptional. Um, and I really wanted others to experience a similar thing. Um, and I realized that I didn't even know I was being trafficked when it was happening. So, um, I, I started to dedicate my life to bringing awareness to human trafficking. And I really started, um, my journey as really working as a peer support worker. Um, I connected with individuals who had experienced similar things. And then slowly I decided I wanted to do more. Um, and currently I'm at victim services and I also, um, work very closely with Durham regional police and the human trafficking unit, uh, We know that uh, sometimes law enforcement is the first point of contact, um, and we want to ensure that an individual has a a good experience. Um, So we've taken on what they call a client-centered or victim-centered approach, where every time they meet with an individual, they actually bring myself. So that individual has the opportunity to speak to police or not talk to them at all with zero pressure to ever report, and they can then meet with me confidentially, and I'll help them to meet their unique needs in any way. Wow, Carly, I'm so grateful um, for you to be here today and to shed light on your experience, but also for the way that you seek to help and support others. That's truly inspiring. And so thank you for what you do every day to help individuals who are exiting these types of situations. You mentioned that today you're a human trafficking intervention counselor. What is that role? What does that entail? And what does that kind of look like day to day? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a lot. Um, I try to do as much as I possibly can. Um, but a big, the biggest piece is really meeting individuals where they're at, um, identifying where, um, where they feel they are. Um, and helping them to navigate and connect with services and supports that will meet their unique needs. It's really around listening to the individual and understanding, you know, what's best for them, what's worked for them before, what maybe has never worked for them. Um, So what worked for me may not work for everybody. Um, So it's really about listening. It's really about getting to know somebody, building a relationship, building that trust, which is huge. Um, It's hard to trust somebody. It's hard to trust a stranger. Um, So a big piece is really meeting people where they're at, uh, connecting them to the appropriate resources that meet their um, unique needs, um, walking beside them throughout their journey for as long as that may take. Um, I don't ever close a case. I'll work with somebody as long as they need um, uh, and really help them to find out what works and what doesn't work. Um, I'll help them make those phone calls. I'll help them connect with those resources. I'll help them, uh, you know, if they need to connect with um, counselors or therapists or go to the hospital or whatever that looks like, um, I pretty much will do whatever it takes to make sure those needs are met. On top of that, my role also is about helping them to access some of those really basic needs. Um, And oftentimes that means we need funding to do that. Um, So across Ontario, we have a program called the Victim Quick Response Program, where individuals who identify as being trafficked can access that program where I can apply to try and get funding to really meet some of those basic needs from safe accommodation to um, uh, uh, treatment centers, to uh, trauma therapy, to, you know, meals and groceries, basic necessities these all those things um, and then on top of that uh, we do a lot of advocacy um, and we do a lot of education and awareness we are currently in every grade nine class across Durham region 
um, to bring awareness to human trafficking. So we're in both the Catholic and the public school board and working towards getting into the French school board as well um, to really equip young people with the knowledge and information um, to know when this could be potentially happening before it's too late. I always say that education is power. And I often wonder if somebody came into my high school when I was growing up and spoke to me about human trafficking, would it have happened to me? Or would I have been able to identify those red flags before it was too late? So that's a big piece that we do today. And then on top of that, we collaborate with all kinds of different agencies um, throughout uh, Ontario and Canada, really, to ensure those unique needs are met. And one of those partnerships is the police. I kind of spoke about that. I go out with the police to every single call. Uh, we also work closely with financial assistance um, to ensure that an individual can get connected immediately so they have their own money and don't depend on uh, the trafficker to purchase certain basic necessities. Um, we have partnered with the hospital so they don't have to wait in waiting rooms uh, for hours to see somebody. Um, so we've really connected and built a model uh, based on this victim or client-centered approach to ensure that everybody's needs are met in hopefully the, the most sensitive and, and um trauma-informed way. So many incredible initiatives and important work that you're undertaking. And one thing, as I was reflecting on all these pieces that you were talking about, you know, journeying with an individual and meeting them where they're at and advocacy and equipping folks with what they need and, and funding. And then education is power, as you shared, and prevention education and then collaboration. Really, you've helped us to see and understand that Fighting human trafficking in our community is a multi-pronged approach. You know, you can, it's not a one size fit all for survivor care. It's not a one size fit all for like, We need to work together to find ways to address this problem from early intervention and prevention to journeying with folks. And I just, I really appreciated what you shared about how you meet each individual where they're at and that they're a unique individual, because you're so right, like each person's experience is completely different. And each human has unique desires and dreams for the future and hopes and plans and um, different needs. And so I really appreciate the way in which you approach relationships um, with these folks to be able to journey alongside them. Another piece that was a highlight to me was when you shared how there's no end date when you're working alongside someone and that you journey with them as long as they need. So can you just maybe reflect on like, why is that so important? Why do we need to view each individual as an individual? And why can't we say, you know, okay, one year program and now you're on your own. Like why, why is lifelong journeying alongside someone so important? Um, I think there's a lot of different aspects um, to that question, but I think the biggest thing is um, we all experience different vulnerabilities. We all experience different traumas throughout our life. We all um, are brought up a different way. We all have different cultural or religious beliefs. Um, and I think that's what makes us all very special and, and individualized. And if we group everybody into the same category of you've been trafficked, um, we are going to miss so many different people. And also we're not going to be able to empower people um, to see all of their unique um, uniqueness um, that they bring and all their strengths and their resilience. Um, and so it's really important that, um, that, a, that an intervention or a support program is really catered to each individual. And like I said earlier, it's really listening and getting to know somebody. Um, and, and that's, really what helps somebody to exit successfully. If you're not going to take the time to sit and listen and, and try new things, because sometimes I'll meet with somebody and I'll ask them, you know, what do you think you need right now? And they might say, I don't know, but then we can try different things together. Um, and it's, it's really hard to do those things on your own. Um, so it's really important to have somebody who is going to be able to walk beside you. And sometimes that can take, you know, months, years, however long, um, and there's no time limit on it because what if it if I got out one in one try, um, I've worked with many people where it may take uh, three or four or five or, or you know, double digits of, of how long it takes to exit. Um, and it also is really important to know that our goals um, are, are all measured differently. Um, you know, it's not up to me to impose my goals on somebody else. 
um, or impose their goals on them. Their goals and their dreams are their goals and their dreams. I'm there to walk beside them. So what is a success for one person might not be a success for somebody else. Um, so a success for, for somebody maybe to go back to school and a success for somebody else maybe to get their own um, apartment and start their own life um, and build that. So it's, it's not fair for us also to say, okay, in order for you to be successful, um, you know, you must be able to, you know, get out, get your own place, pay your bills, go to school, get a job. Like, and that's not fair for us to put that on anybody. So it's really, again, about listening to somebody's unique needs, because if we don't, we're going to miss some really, really amazing qualities and amazing strengths in somebody um, that could actually help to shape and change things in a way that otherwise wouldn't if we didn't take that time and push them to do something that maybe wasn't um, wasn't for them. Absolutely. Projecting our own expectations or views of what we think um, healing should look like or someone's journey should look like um, is definitely not the solution, but listening to each individual to understand their goals and hopes and dreams. Um, that's really amazing. And I'm so grateful that you do that. You mentioned exiting and that it can take multiple attempts for someone to potentially exit an exploitive situation. I'm wondering, someone might be tuning into this episode today and they may be in a trafficking situation. How would that person go about exiting? What does that process entail? Where can they access support? Mm -hmm. um, I think in, I know that in every region there is a victim services across Ontario. Um, and that can always be a first phone call. Uh, victim services can often work almost as like that hub. Um, and really connecting to somebody and finding out what those unique needs are and referring them to the appropriate resources and making sure they get there and walking them through that and, and walking beside them to do those things. Um, there's also the Canadian hotline um, here in Canada where you can call and wherever you are, um, they have all the resources that are specific to um, somebody who may be in a trafficking experience and, and where to call um, and who can help in that region. So that's always a good uh, first step. Um, I, uh, there's, you know, um, I always want to say, you know, like if somebody is listening and, you know, this is something that's happening to them, I want them to know that, you know, there is people out there who care and that you know, they're not all alone. Um, and if you do reach out, um, there are people who will help. And, and I can tell you, I will do whatever I can to try and ensure that somebody gets the appropriate resources and supports. And I know across Ontario and across Canada, there's many other um, agencies and uh, places who are doing the exact same thing. Um, I could list a whole bunch of names and numbers for all over, but I would say some of the best things to do is really reach out to the victim services um, in, your, in your area, or in fact, call that human trafficking hotline because they really can connect you with any resource, no matter where you are, um, they'll have a list of resources um, of different places and supports you can call. Well, Carly, thank you so much for just having this conversation with me today and shedding light on the importance of meeting people where they're at and journeying alongside individuals who've experienced exploitation in unique ways and listening, listening to individuals with lived experiences you've highlighted and the importance of education. And I'm excited to unpack that some more with you afterwards because we're going to take a short break and then we'll be right back. Hi, and welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking. In today's episode, we're addressing the realities of what human trafficking looks like here in Ontario with expert Carly Church. So I'm so glad, Carly, that you're here to continue this discussion with me. And you mentioned previously in our discussion that education is power and that it's so important to equip people with knowledge as a way to prevent this crime from happening in the first place. So could you take some time to explain to our viewers what is human trafficking and how prevalent is it in Ontario? Sure. Um, so I always, when I have this conversation, I always start off by saying like, when I was being trafficked, I actually had no idea that that's what was happening to me because I thought it had to look like the movies. Um, you know, any education I had around human trafficking came from movies or media and it, it's human trafficking doesn't look like how it's portrayed in movies. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. 
um, because uh, young people aren't getting the education um, around what it truly looks like. Um, so really what human, like human trafficking is a really umbrella term. Um, there's many forms of human trafficking from forced labor to migrant workers to organ harvesting to international and domestic sex trafficking. Um, I really focus on uh, domestic sex trafficking, reason being that's um, my area of expertise. That's what happened to me. Um, so I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit of what domestic sex trafficking looks like in, in Canada or in Ontario. Um, and my definition for domestic uh, sex trafficking is really, I have a cheating definition. There's long wordy ones uh, from the UN, from the criminal code. Um, but I really sum it up by saying there's certain elements that need to be present in order for human trafficking to exist. So there needs to be force. There needs to be fraud. There needs to be coercion. And it all needs to be facilitated by a third party or a group of people. So somebody behind the scenes doing it to you and profiting from you. That domestic word is also important to understand because it looks a lot different than international. Domestic means that you are from one country or who have come to that country for nothing to do with trafficking, lived there for however long, and then were trafficked within that country. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important to note that the majority of trafficking that occurs in Canada is domestic sex trafficking, which means it's happening to our boys and our girls. It's happening to the same kids that access the same community centers and the same schools and the same libraries that the children in your communities access. That's who it's happening to. Um, and really, I know that a lot of people, I always also compare what human trafficking actually looks like in Ontario to the movie Taken. Uh, biggest reason is because that's one of the, the biggest movies that taught me what, hum, what I thought human trafficking looked like. And really in that movie, it shows two young girls flying to another country. You know, they meet a, a complete stranger at an airport. They're brought to a, um, they share a cab with that person. They share that they're there alone. Um, you know, they later that evening, they come back, they break in. There's a dramatic scene. The girls are fighting two men off in the living room. One's hiding underneath the bed. They're pulled from underneath the bed. They're kidnapped, forcibly removed, moved to another location, locked up in separate rooms and then sold into the sex trade. Every single thing in, about that movie is the exact opposite of what we really see in Ontario. Wow. Um, like what we really see happening here is not that you uh, find a complete stranger who traffics you. You usually know your trafficker. There is some kind of connector link between you and the person who intends on trafficking you. Maybe you went to the same high school. Maybe you grew up in the same neighborhood. Maybe it's your cousin's friend's friend. Maybe it's somebody who likes a lot of your Instagram pictures or has a lot of mutual friends on show, social media. There's some kind of connector link that causes you to put your guard down and be more likely to engage in conversation. Also from that movie, those girls were kidnapped. Um, it's not really what it looks like. You go with that person because they've built some form of relationship with you. You go with that person because they've taken time out of their life to ask you about yours. You go with that person because they've started to meet every single one of your basic needs and you feel as if they're going to take care of you, that they've been there for you in a way that nobody else has. You go with that person because you believe your life will be better with them. They've got to know every detail about you and found out everything that's lacking in your life and provided that for you. The other big misconception from that movie is these girls were locked up in rooms. How many people have seen posters where girls' wrists are bound, their mouths are uh, taped shut, they're behind bars? Um, that's not what it looks like. It feels like there's invisible bars, but you are not, you are rarely tied up. You are rarely locked in a room. Um, you stay because if you believe that if you leave, nobody's going to love you that way again. Nobody's going to treat you that way again. Nobody's going to be able to meet your needs like that again. That's why you stay. Uh, and then there's many different myths and misconceptions from that movie. Um, but another really big one um, that I'll touch on is a lot of people believe that you are either beaten every day um, or you are uh, street involved or you are addicted to a substance. Um, and yes, those things all make you more susceptible or more vulnerable to being trafficked. But I can tell you that I work with a lot of young people who are under the age of 18 who go to school Monday to Friday. Their trafficker picks them up Friday after school. Um, and that trafficker traffics them from Friday night, Saturday night, brings them back home Sunday for curfew. And they've told their caregivers that they were at a friend's um, or made some, uh, some similar story. Uh, so that they weren't out looking for them. You don't have to be a missing person. You do not have to be street involved um, and you do not have to be um, uh, beaten every day in order to stay. Um, this is more of what human trafficking looks like. Um, traffickers are preying on your vulnerabilities. They're getting to know you in a way that they've never, that nobody's taken the time to get to know you and they begin to fill all of your needs, making it feel as if that's the best your life has ever been. Um, and that's really why you go with that individual. Wow, you have helped paint a picture of the realities versus what people 
their misconceptions are really based on movies and the media. And one that stuck out to me as you were sharing was that the, the last situation you explained where someone can be at home going to school and then they're gone for the weekend saying they're at a friend's house, but in a situation of exploitation. So someone can literally be living at home and experiencing exploitation. With COVID-19, we know that the pandemic has impacted trafficking in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could help shed light on in what ways has that changed and facilitated how trafficking happens and even what it looks like within the context of Ontario? Yeah, um, I think this is a really good conversation to have because um, traffickers have really adapted to the pandemic quicker than um, a lot of social supports have adapted to the pandemic um, and really taken um, the pandemic almost as an opportunity uh, to recruit more young, vulnerable individuals. Um, so as soon as the lockdowns began, schools no longer were happening, um, or if they were going on, they were online. Um, and one of the uh, most common ways for traffickers to recruit young people is online. Um, so that blew up uh, in an increasing way. Um, and like I said, traffickers took advantage of this. So now young people are out of their normal routine. Um, they're no longer going to school Monday to Friday. They're no longer around their friends um, or maybe even their healthy supports. Um, they are no longer in their doing their sporting events or their after school extracurricular um, activities. Um, they are now isolated and at home, oftentimes with little to no super adult supervision. Mm -hmm. um, so what is happening? They're increasing their screen time. They're going on social media more often. They're putting their whole lives on social media, which traffickers are able to identify vulnerabilities without them even knowing by the maybe the posts that they make their photos that they put, um, different quotes that they might be putting up there. And it's really easy for a trafficker to sit behind a computer screen and reach out to multiple young people at one time, hoping that one or two will bite. Um, and especially with the in the decrease of having that structure and having their, um, their regular daily um, uh, events and friends and things like that. They were looking, a lot of young people were feeling alone and isolated and they were looking for friendship online. Um, so this really increased the ability for traffickers to recruit a lot of young vulnerable individuals. Um, and a lot of them were never meeting these individuals. They were just talking to them online and becoming friends then and not meeting them until much later. You mentioned something very interesting, a concept of oversharing when, you know, a youth might put a quote online or post certain images that the trafficker then somehow identifies an unmet need and then uses that for manipulation. Can you give an example? Like if someone's listening to this and they're like, well, how do I know if my child's oversharing or how do I create a conversation with them to help them understand what I should be sharing online and not sharing online? What would be some of the tips that you would give folks? Yeah, like I, a lot of young people that I work with oftentimes will have things where they might get into a fight with a caregiver or a family member or be struggling at home and they might write that on their um, on their social media platform, you know, fighting with my parents, I need to get out of here, um, feeling, feeling boxed in, um, you know, and, and a lot of young people do express a lot of things online and it's, it's a natural way to express is to talk about things, but to post that online, that then becomes quite visible to anybody and everybody. And we don't know always who somebody is that we're talking to online. Um, it's very easy for a trafficker to pose as another 17 year old um, and befriend somebody. We don't actually know those pictures aren't yeah, pictures can be faked online. Um, it's really important for caregivers to know um, when um, uh, to, to talk to their young people about online safety, about um, different tips and techniques, you know, make sure that your social media is private. Not everybody can go on and take a look at it. Um, make sure you know who is all on your list. You know, go through that list and and see, OK, do I even know this person? Have I ever met this person? Um, another thing is really important is not to have your location on. Oftentimes pictures, a location goes with your picture. You post that picture and then somebody knows where you are. Um, so these are little tips and stuff to keep youth safe online. Um, I always talk to youth a lot about sending pictures online as well. Um, if you send anything over the Internet, it's gone. 
Um, you can't just get it back even if it's deleted. Um, that picture could go anywhere. Um, and these are conversations that are important to have with young people um, because you don't always know that that could potentially happen or the risks of not having your accounts private because you may not see your, that somebody doesn't have to be on your friend list to see everything that you're doing. Um, and sometimes when we write certain things, um, that can show that vulnerability, um, especially if you're talking about, you know, feeling lonely or feeling isolated or feeling caged in. Um, and we know that the pandemic did this to a lot of individuals. Um, you know, uh, it was, uh, mental health was uh, very difficult um, during the pandemic um, and continues today. Um, to adapt to all that change. So it's um, it's definitely a conversation to have with our young people around safety online. And there's lots of tips on different websites. Um, we have a Stop HT website and we have a, um, a video on there about keeping youth safe online. You mentioned also um, how youth may feel pressured to send photos and when it's out there, it's out there and that's a growing issue in our communities. So I just want to let folks know there's a resource called needhelpnow.ca where if you've sent an image, intimate image online and need help retrieving it, they can help you do that. But Carly, as we wrap up our discussion today, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, I think I just want people to know that, you know, this is happening. This is happening in our communities. Uh, it's more prevalent than you can probably imagine. Uh, it is the fastest growing crime in Canada. Um, and it's incredibly important that we educate um, not only ourselves, um, but our, our young people in order to combat human trafficking. We really need to hit it at both ends um, where we do that prevention, that education and awareness piece. Also with the supports and services um, to help people who are exiting. Um, and just final words, I just want any Anybody who's listening that this might be happening to, I want you to know how resilient you are and strong you are um, and how there's so much help out there. Uh, and if you ever need anything to please, please reach out. There are people who care. Hmm. Well, Carly, thank you so much for using your voice to be an advocate for others and to shine light on this injustice. I'm really grateful for your courage and your resiliency to do this work every day and for all of your team at Victim Services for providing wraparound supports to survivors, for doing education and awareness and advocacy and collaboration. I'm really grateful for everything that you're doing to address this problem. If you are currently in a situation um, and you're in immediate danger, please call 911 if you're able to. If not, you can access the Human Trafficking Hotline 24-7 at 1-833-900-1010. Again, that's 1-833-900-1010. Thanks so much for tuning in to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, and we hope to catch you next time.